Hello everyone. In this video we're going to begin our discussion of recursion. We're primarily going to investigate recursion by studying actual algorithms that solve problems. The first of which is going to be selection sort, which we have here. This is a sorting algorithm that takes an array and its size is input, and the result is a sorted array. So let's find out how this works by looking at the code. If we look at the code here, we see that if the array is small, less than one element, so this is our base case for our recursion, then we don't need to do anything, there's nothing to sort. If the array is not small, if we don't enter that first if statement, then we're going to loop over the entire array, and we're going to compare the element we are investigating, the ith element, to the last element of the array. If the element we are investigating, ace AI, is bigger than the last element, we're going to swap their positions. Once we've iterated through the entire array, we will have continually performed this swap, and eventually, because we've compared every single element to the one in the final position of the array, we'll have found the maximum element of the array, and it will be in position AN. So, by doing this, we, we slowly iterate through the array until we find the maximum, and we take that maximum and put it at the end of the array. We then will perform the same thing and find this next to max element, and then the next to next to max element, and repeat that recursively until the array is sorted. Now, how do we actually analyze something like this? If you remember, there are several ways we can analyze recursions. But in order to analyze them, we need to express the runtime as a recurrence relation. How do we do that? Well, first, let's let t of n be the runtime of selection sort. on array of size n. We aren't normally going to bother writing this out, but we really want to make sure we understand what's going on here. So let's look at the different parts of the code. Lines 2 through 4 take constant time. Inside of the for loop, we're doing an if check and then a swap, so all of this code takes constant time, and we are looping n minus 1 times, so all of the code, lines 5 through 9, takes c times n minus 1 time, and then we are making a call to selection sort, and this is where we need to be careful, and this is how our technique will be developed, is selection sort there is the function we are analyzing. Originally, we were analyzing it as if it had size n. We then make a call to the function, and we do that with size n minus 1. So, we are going to know how long that takes because we have an expression for how long does selection sort take with a given input size. If we look at that, that is exactly what we need to understand there. How long does that line take, line 10, when and it's just selection sort with an input of size n minus 1. So my total runtime, t of n, is equal to c, of n c times n minus 1 from the for loop plus t of n minus 1. Now we have a recurrence relation that relates t with a particular input to some other stuff, and then t with a smaller input. The thing in blue there is a recurrence relation. In order to successfully solve this, we also need to have a base case. We need to understand something about when does the recurrence terminate and how long does that take. Well, if we look at our code, we know that when we have an array of size less than 1, so 0, that it will terminate. So we also know that t of 0, the runtime on an array of size 0, is constant. A diligent student will notice that the 
constants there might be different. They are representing different things. For our purposes, we don't particularly care. But if you wanted to be extra diligent, you could call those different things. C1 and C2, C and C prime, whatever you want. How do we analyze these? Well, we have a variety of techniques. We have the recursion tree method, which you likely learned last year. We also have the method of substitution, or you may have called this uh, expansion into a series. All of those are acceptable names for it. So let's try and analyze. What we're going to do is take our expression We want to understand what is t of n minus 1. Well, the only thing we know about t, really, is that it obeys that formula there. If it obeys that formula, then I should be able to plug in other values. So if we plug into star, we can I'll try and understand what is t of n minus 2 to. So plug n minus 1 into star and we get t of n minus 1. We're plugging in n minus 1 for every copy of n. This is equal to c of n minus 1 minus 1 plus t of the same n minus 1 minus 1. Maybe simplify that a little bit. That's t of n minus 1 is equal to c times n minus 2 plus t of n minus 2. We're now going to substitute this expression we have into that equation there. So t of n is equal to c times n minus 1 plus plug in our expression over from over there and we have c times n minus 2 plus t of n minus 2. It doesn't look like that's helped too much yet, so let's make another substitution. So let's plug n minus 2 into star. And I'm going to skip a bit of the algebra here. I get t of n minus 2 is equal to c of n minus 2 minus 1. That's c times n minus 3 plus t of n minus 2 minus 1. That's n minus 3. Let's substitute that in again. Repeat the process. We get t of n on the left-hand side still, not doing anything there, is equal to c times n minus 1 plus c times n minus 2 plus make the substitution, and we have c times n minus 3 plus t of n minus 3. Now let's try and see what's happening here. We want to try to identify a pattern because we are hoping that we can identify a pattern and find out when does that pattern terminate. So. If we look, let's write this down a little neater. This is t of n equals c times n minus 1 plus c times n minus 2 plus c times n minus 3 plus t of n minus 3. We need to try and find out how do the things relate. In particular, we have a couple of expressions we are looking at. We're going to be looking at star and then I'll call it star star, and then star star star. We're trying to identify a pattern there. The number of stars here is kind of helpful. If I look at the first expression there, I have c of n minus 1 and t of n minus 1. In the next one, I have two terms c of n minus 1, c of n minus 2, and a t of n minus 2. In the first one I had n minus 1 and one term. In the next one I had n minus 2 and two terms. And in the third one I have three terms and n minus 3. 
So there seems to be some relation between the number of terms at the start and what we are subtracting from the size of input on the right hand side. How can we use that? Well, we need to interpolate a pattern here. And how are we going to do that? Well, we know if we try to just expand upon what we've seen so far, t of n is equal to c times n minus 1 plus c times n minus 2 plus c times n minus 3 plus, and if we kept doing that until we had n minus k, well, like, let, well let's look at the pattern. If we went down to n minus 3, we had t of n minus 3. If we went down to n minus 2, we had t of n minus 2. If we went down to n minus 1, we had t of n minus 1. So here, I had better have t of n minus k to satisfy the pattern we had noticed before. Why does this help us? We now have a variable to play with that we can decide what it is. That expression I wrote down is true for any value of k. Any value of k greater than or equal to 1, I guess, to make sure that we actually have the first equation correct. So, how can we use this? Well, we know one other fact we have yet to use, which is we have a base case for our recursion. If we scroll up, what was our base case? Our base case was that when we plugged in 0 to, four, to t, we had a constant runtime. So, we know that if I plug in 0 to t, that I get constant. Let us try and use that fact. We want that the thing inside of t, which in this case is m minus k, is equal to our convenient value from our base case. So we want to choose k such that n minus k is equal to 0. And I want to solve that for k. Solving that for k, k equals n. Let's use that information. We have t of n is equal to c n minus 1 plus c times n minus 2 plus, I'm going to cut out some of the terms just to help my handwriting, plus c of n minus n, I'm plugging in that value of k that I chose, plus t of 0. I know n minus k equals 0 because I chose n minus k to equal that. Now, we've caused our nice thing to happen, which is that that term is now constant. We no longer have any recursive calls on the right-hand side. We've reached the base case. How many terms were appearing in that summation there? Well, there should have been k of them, which would be n terms. And we're adding up the numbers c plus 2c plus 3c plus 4c all the way up until c of n minus 1. So if you're going to try to be efficient about this, maybe we just notice that t of n is equal to n minus 1 times n over 2 times c. Why is that the case? Well, it's an arithmetic summation. We're adding up a bunch of integers, and we have the largest integer being n minus 1, and there are n minus 1 terms. Why are there only n minus 1 that we care about? Well, because that last term is 0. And then we still have a plus c. What is the asymptotic complexity then? Well, we can identify that. So, t of n is in the largest term. There would be n squared, so we're in theta of n squared. That'll be our official runtime. So this sorting algorithm, selection sort, runs in theta n squared time, where n is the size of the array we are sorting. We'll discuss whether or not that is a good runtime later, but for now we've identified a runtime for this algorithm. 
in the future, we're going to be omitting many of these steps, and we'll do this much more quickly, and you should be very skilled at doing these substitutions as swiftly as you can. We will also see some other ways of writing things down, including different ways of writing down summations. I will mention it here. I could have, just as easily, written this as the sum from i equals 1 to k of c times n minus i plus t of 0. I could have just as easily done that. There is no difference between writing it out with the dot 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 notation and the summation notation. It really depends on what feels natural for the problem. 